Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the orbital today, oops, and electron configurations. So we had some problems with the Bohr model. The shell model built upon the, the Bohr model, and the two are very similar. Um, the Bohr model electrons follow the circular orbits that are exact distance from the nucleus. The shell model electrons circulate on the perimeters of spheres that are exact distance from the nucleus. And then there are other differences, but we're not going to worry about them. So computers use to determine the approximate size and shape of orbitals for different elements. So it, this process is lots of calculations. Um, the wave function formulas work like multi-electron atoms, which are unlike Bohr's. The quantum model accounts for the different energy levels or the subshells within a shell. And every electron within a given subshell of an atom, the 1s, 2s, 2p, is at the same quantized energy level. So what is an orbital? It's just a graphic representation of the space an electron occupies 90% of the, of the time. It's more of a concept than a physical structure. So these are where electrons can be found 100% of the time, right? Well, here's the orbital. They spend most of the time in this, in this path. So we say, okay, well, here's a graphic representation of a 1s orbital. It's a sphere. There are three p orbitals, px, py, and z. They sit on different axes. And when you overlap them, they're all the same shape. But again, it's still kind of a sphere, right? That's why we, when we have models of atoms, they're usually circular. Okay. The 3p orbitals are going to be larger than the 2p. The 4p orbitals will be larger than the 3p. So electrons are added to the lowest energy orbital available. That's because nature just favors lower energy systems. All right, so here's the filling order, right? You read it the way uh, you read a book from left to right until you get to the element that you're, lo that you're looking for. So an element's electron configuration contains every lower energy orbital and energy level that it comes before it. So electrons enter and fill the lowest energy orbital first, and so the energy level um, of the subshell increases as you move across from left to right, and then increases again as you start the next row. And if you look at the top row of the D block, it's n equals 3, right? So this would be n equals 1, this is n equals 2, n equals 3. That's just what n is your, your, your energy level. Um, so uh, 3D is at a higher energy than 4S. If it wasn't, the 3D would fill before 4S. And then after 6S, you start filling 4F. Okay, 4F. So filling orbitals, hydrogen has one electron. This is N, your principal quantum number is N, or your energy level. This is your energy level. It's in the first row in the subshell S, and there's one of them there. Helium, first energy level, S subshell, there's two electrons there. Lithium is 1S2, 2S1, or you could abbreviate it by putting the um, noble gas that comes before it in brackets. Beryllium. So look at the order. It's always this order. Okay, rules for filling orbitals. Each orbital can hold a maximum of two. So this is the Aufbau principle, right? Um, two electrons will spin in opposite directions. The P subshell has three orbitals. The D subshell has five orbitals. The F shell has uh, seven orbitals. When you have more than one orbital in a subshell, the F, P, D, and F, a single spin up electron is added to the orbital before you start. So this is Hund's rule. They have opposite spins. So here's lithium. I know my electron configuration is this for lithium. So I have one up arrow, one down arrow, one up arrow. This is for fluorine, electron configuration for fluorine. 
when I fill these, I'll have one up, one down, one up, one down, and then I go up, 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 down, down. If it, and if it had an electron, then I'd go down again. So here for nitrogen, this is not nitrogen because you have to go up, up, up. They don't pair up until they have to, right? They're negative. They repel each other. They don't want to be next to each other. All right, paramagnetic and diamagnetic. So paramagnetic electrons are unpaired electrons, and they cause a magnetic moment. Um, the net magnetic moment in the atom will interact with a magnetic field, which results in an attraction to that field. So that's how we know. Diamagnetic, everybody's paired up. No unpaired electrons. So there's no magnetic moment. All right, the shielding effect. So we're going to use a shielding effect to look at periodic properties of elements. Um, and it's related to nuclear charge. So as you get, as your shells get larger and larger than the previous shells, you have more and more electrons that are shielding your valence um, electrons from the nucleus. So you have your effective nuclear charge, or ZEF. Your ZEF is the charge experienced by a, the, an electron. So those are your protons. So you can think of ZEF as the number of protons almost. Z is the actual nuclear charge or your atomic number of your element. And the sigma is this little shielding constant. So repulsive forces caused by the shielding effect reduce your nuclear charge, ex your ZEF, experienced by outer electrons. So we can predict these four properties on the, the periodic table. So atomic radius, remember, increases down and decreases to the left. So the atomic radius is the defined as half the distance between two nuclei. So if we have two atoms here, that's the distance. That's your atomic uh, radius, half of that. So your atomic radius increases while moving down a group, so down a group, because your principal quantum number increases, right? You're adding a row of energy levels. And so does your size, right? A 2s orbital is much larger than a 1s orbital because you added another layer, you added another shell. So with each layer, you increase your radius. Atomic radius decreases as you move this way because of ZEF. ZEF. So your nuclear charge is increasing. Your number of protons is increasing, right? Let's see, what is it? This is, so 19, 20. These are your atomic numbers, which is your number of protons. So they're increasing as you go this way. So you're feeling more and more of a charge. The increasing number of protons creates a greater force of attraction on the elements. And since you're in the same row, you're not adding any more layers. Um, but you're increasing your number of protons. So that greater force pulls them closer into the center, causing the atomic radius to decrease. So um, new shells are added. The principal quantum number increases. Valence electrons have more energy. They're less stable. They're further from the nucleus. The outer electrons experience a greater shielding effect and a decreased effective, law of effective charge because of Coulomb's law. The attraction decreases as the distance between the electrons and protons increase. So if I ask you, um, why does um, this element have a smaller radius than another element? This is your justification. Okay, so if I ever ask you to justify your answer about atomic radius, this is it. Okay, so we learned in the first video that we saw electrons in a successive subshell sub sub shell experience a slightly greater shielding effect than electrons in the previous shell, right? So this is, again, due to the fact that the electrons in the previous subshell have a greater electron density with a closer proximity to the nucleus. Although the ionization energies for the um, electrons within the different subshells of a shell are not exactly the same, they're still similar when you compare the ionization energies from other subshells. So this evidence shows us that the shielding effect experienced by the electrons in different subshells are different but quite similar.
Okay, so potassium loses an electron to form a positive cation and an electron. Chlorine gains an electron to form a negative ion, right? Metals lose electrons, so these are your cations. Non-metals gain electrons, these are your anions. Um, hydrogen is an exception, it could be a metal, uh, it could gain or lose um, depending on what it's bonded to. Isoelectronic species, so these are um, elements that have the same electronic config configuration but different radii. So elements tend to gain or lose electrons to acquire the same electron configuration as their noble gases because, the, because they're more stable. When electrons are removed, the number of protons stays the same, but the number of electrons repelling each other is reduced. So this allows them to be pulled closer to the positive nucleus. Also, the amount of positive charge pulling on each electron increases. And uh, most importantly, many atoms lose their outermost shell when they lose their valence electrons to become cations. So when an, an atom loses its outermost shell, its radius decreases dramatically. When an atom gains electrons, the number of electrons repelling each other increases. This causes them to move further away from the nucleus. So in these anions, the radius nearly doubles when electrons are added. Okay, so ionic radius down a group. This is, these are your justifications. Ionic radius of cations. Again, this is how you would justify your answer to explain why uh, cations are smaller. These are your justifications for why anions get larger. For ionization energy, so the names ionization energy and ionization potential are interchangeable again. The fact that energy must always be added to remove an electron means that this is an endothermic process. So all ionization potentials have the positive values, and if energy was released, it would be negative, right? Okay, so these are your trends. Ionization in energy increases up and to the right. Generally, it requires more energy to remove an electron from an atom as the effective nuclear charge, or your ZEF, increases, and as the atomic radius decreases. The electrons are closer to the protons in a smaller atom, and so they're held more tightly to the nucleus. So therefore, it uh, requires more energy to pull them off. There are some exceptions to this rule. Generally, it's harder to pull an electron out of a full subshell than it is to pull an electron out of a subshell that only um, contains only like one or two electrons. It's harder to pull an electron from the first 2s subshell in beryllium than it is to pull out an electron of a 2p sublevel in boron. Okay. Okay, so first, ionization energy. These are your justifications. Oh. Reducing the distance between <clears throat> the nucleus and the electrons increase the force of attraction um, on electrons. So it's harder to remove a negative charge from something that has an overall positive charge. So when the electron configuration drops, an energy level, the radius becomes significantly smaller. So this accounts for the greater increase in ionization potential, as a much smaller radius means that there's a much stronger force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons. Electronegativity, it's the ability, um, an element's ability to attract electrons in a chemical bond. The electrons will spend more time around the more electronegative element in a chemical bond. So our trends for electronegativity, up and to the right, we don't care about noble gases. Um, they don't tend to form chemical bonds, although we'll see that xenon and krypton, um, they actually do form some, but that's later. Okay, here's your justification for um, electronegativity. And try these problems and we'll work on them in class.